Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's installment of Cincinnati Song Initiative's Coffee Combo Series. Um, my name is Sam Martin, and I'm the founding artistic director of Cincinnati Song Initiative. And today we're really excited to be in conversation uh, revolving around the uh, topic of commissioning new art song, which is the process of bringing brand new art song into the repertoire by reaching out to composers and uh, going through that whole process that ultimately uh, winds up with the premiere uh, of a brand new song or song cycle that we hope then stays in the uh, repertoire for all time. So we have a really great panel of uh, people to discuss this topic with us today. But first, I just wanted to take care of some housekeeping notes. Um, uh, in case you're new to Cincinnati Song Initiative or this live stream, or you're tuning in on our website or on Facebook, um, I wanna draw your attention to uh, our new uh, digital project called CSI Digital, um, where we will be um, delivering all of our content to you through this platform this coming season and beyond. Um, including this year our all digital main stage series of live music performances, which we're really, really excited to uh, present to you. And you can learn uh, all about that on our website. I encourage you to sign up for uh, a membership um, at CSI Digital. Uh, the, web, uh, the, the link is below on your screen and you'll be able to engage with the Cincinnati Song Initiative community that way this entire year while we are unfortunately continued to be relegated to uh, the online platform. But we have some really innovative and exciting programming that we've uh, started this summer and that we will be rolling out new programs um, and lots of great stuff like that in the year to come. In addition, of course, to our live music uh, performances, which we would uh, never ever uh, stop producing, no matter what the circumstances. So encourage you to sign up for a CSI Digital uh, Pass today and uh, stick with us throughout this coming year. Um, so uh, I think without any further ado, I'm gonna bring in our distinguished panel and um, you guys, you guys, I'll just get to listen awkwardly while I read little mini bios and tell tell everybody how awesome all you are, okay? <laughs> all right, so I'll start with uh, Dr. Melissa Dumphy. Melissa Dumphy um, immigrated to the United States in 2003 from Australia and has since become an award-winning and acclaimed composer specializing in vocal, political, and theatrical music. Her first song cycle, Tesla's Pigeon, has been recognized with several awards, including first place in the 2012 National Association of Teachers of Singing Art Song Competition. In addition to uh, her concert and choral music, Melissa is a Barrymore Award-nominated composer and sound designer working with Philadelphia area theaters, and she has been director of music composition at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center National Puppetry Conference since 2014. She lives in Philadelphia and currently lectures at Rutgers University and her bio is so much so much more and in depth and cool than that. So go check it out. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, so happy to be here. Renaldo Moya is a graduate of Venezuela's El, uh, El Sistema Music Education System and was a founding member of the Simon Bolivar Orchestra, which tours throughout Europe, North and South America. He has been composer in residence at the Schubert Club in Minnesota, and he's the recipient of the Charles Ives Fellowship from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, among many other prestigious awards and fellowships. He has taught at St. Olaf College and Interlochen Arts Camp, and is currently an assistant professor of composition at Augsburg University in Minneapolis. Welcome, Reynaldo. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Laura Strickling is a celebrated soprano. Supl <laughs> I need some more coffee. Known distinctly for her work in performing and promoting art songs with an emphasis on bringing new music into the repertoire. She curated the soprano anthology of songs from New Music Shelf and has collaborated with numerous composers, including Tom Cipullo, Juliana Hall, Libby Larson, James Matheson, John Musto, and the late Glenn Robin. She can be heard on numerous discs and has presented a radio broadcast recital of American songs on live from WFMT in Chicago with pianist Daniel Schlossberg. A Chicago native, Laura is an avid traveler having lived in Morocco and Afghanistan and she currently makes her home in St. Thomas as you can tell by the beautiful background. <laughs> and Laura is a, a, a member of CSI's advisory council and we are so thrilled to have her on the team 
Thank you, Soplano, Laura Strickland. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody. Thanks for getting the head start on the on the swag on the swag showing. Cheers to you all with your coffee. Thank hey. you for being here. Okay, so we're here to talk about um what it's like and take a deep dive into commissioning art song. Um much of which we uh talk about this hour could probably be applied to commissioning of any new classical music. Um, but there's probably some very specific uh, things that we'll touch on that directly relate to art song. So um, uh, we're going to get the, the perspective of composers and performers as well. Um, but I want to just kind of kick things off by asking, what does the start of a commissioning process look like? I don't know, Melissa or Ronaldo, if you want to speak to that, I mean, how, how does one start? Where does it start? Well, for me, it's really as simple as uh, getting in touch, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, I have a pretty uh, robust, shall we say, web presence. Uh, I have a website which has my email address uh, proudly displayed for all of the spam bots and commissioners <laughs> to get in touch with me as easily as possible. Uh, and, uh, and I have social media accounts um, on all of the social media networks that are intended for people above the age of 30. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that's usually what happens is someone reaches out to me on one of these platforms um, and either they've performed one of my works so they're familiar with my work that way or they've discovered my work through uh, another performance performance or they've seen some of it online um, and they're curious about, you know, uh, how how the commissioning process works or you know how to go, go about commission. So it really just starts with the conversation. It's a, uh, I don't have an agent, I don't have a manager that people are working through that may happen at some point in the future, but right now it's just me. So might you say that, um, you say it's as simple as just getting in touch. So are, are you encouraging folks to um, not feel like nervous or afraid to reach mm -hmm. out to the famous composer, <laughs> you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, totally not. I mean, yeah. you know, um, first of all, I, I, I don't think I'm particularly famous, but also, <laughs> also, you know, I, I don't bite. And uh, it's just the same process as, you know, I have students that reach out to me. I have, you know, uh, performers that reach out to me to ask me questions about my work. The internet has kind of broken down a lot of the barriers that we used to have you know, when we were kids, I'm giving away my age, but, you know, I turned 40 this year. And when yay. I was a kid, yay, 40. <laughs> and when I was a kid, you know, it's almost like even the living composers weren't real. I mean, yes, the dead composers, obviously, you're never getting in touch with Mozart. But like, even, you know, like John Adams, you're never thinking that that's a real person that you can reach out to. Right. And then the internet and social media kind of changed everything and brought you, you know, into the living rooms of these artists. And now you can, you can just reach out and communicate with them. And I feel like that's what a lot of people are doing. I know that's what I'm doing to the artists that I want to talk to. Um, and so that's, it's made it a lot easier. I, I want to just put a, put a, put a fine point on this uh, specific point. And that's saying that where we are now in society and how we communicate. I mean, of course, you need to communicate in a in a in a certain way, but to to reach out over the internet or via email is not um, is not too forward or too bold anymore. No. It, there's not this. There's not these. There's not this loftiness. Not really. <laughs> right. Not, and I mean, yeah. People worry like, oh, you know, you're going to be too busy. Listen. If I'm too busy to get an email, the email will just sit there in my inbox. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen, right? <laughs> right. Unless you're the kind of person who's a little bit like uh, entitled to communication and starts emailing me every week with, you know, why haven't you answered my email? Just be patient. Sometimes it takes me a month or two. <laughs> <laughs> Especially right. during the pandemic. Right. But, you know, uh, the, the worst thing that can happen is um, the person you're reaching out to will be too busy to respond. But you yeah. never know. Yeah. Ronaldo, anything to add to the idea of how a commission gets started in its very infancy? Yeah. I mean, I think what Melissa just said uh, makes a lot of sense. It's um, we are composers. We are always, I mean, I think it's not just composers, I think musicians, like 
you leave school and you just want to make music with others. Like that's what we were put on this earth to do, right? Like we want to make stuff with other people who make stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and composers, um, unless you're like a great performer, like we are somewhat limited in, in terms of the things that we can do by ourselves. So we're always needing to collaborate and get other friends to come and join us in our crazy endeavor. So by, by all means, exactly. I mean, like, um, I've, you know, now I'm a, I'm a parent, I have two kids and I think that it's a different, um, kind of thing now, like, yeah, if, if I, if I get a, a message from someone and I really honestly don't have the time to, to take on whatever project I've learned, you know, very late in life, I've learned that yes, thanks, but let's talk in a year response, right? It's, it's never like, I don't want to do this. I, it's more like right now where I'm at, like there are enough things on my plate for me to handle. I would be happy to let's, let's, pick this back up in a year or, or in a certain amount of time. But yeah, by, by all means, I think them be respectful, be nice, um, but do get in touch. We composers love, I mean, those are my favorite emails to get in the whole world. <laughs> Hi, I'm a, I'm a performer X, like I've met you or I haven't met you, but I, I, somebody told me about your work or I heard your work somewhere and I really like it. Let's do something together. Yeah. Yeah. Laura, you've been on the other end of it, being a performer who has been involved in much commissioning and bringing commissions to life. Is Does that sound sort of like the experience that you go through yourself as, as the performer reaching out? Or do you have anything to add? Absolutely. I actually am, I would say I'm actually a little new to actively perform, actively con commissioning. For years, I've been doing new music and I've always been brought onto the project by the composer or by an art song presenting body. Like here, we're commissioning this, could you do it? So I've been doing a ton of new music and there was just this part of me that felt like I was imposing if I approached a composer. So what Melissa said was like, absolutely, it spoke to me because, you know, we, we try to be polite. We try to be polite about other people's times. We don't know. I know that Reynaldo has, you know, small children and I don't want to bother him because maybe he's busy. But the thing is, he's absolutely right that, that this is how this is how we keep going as artists. These collaborations matter. And so we should just never assume that someone else is too busy to do, you know, to, 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 to field your request because people will be honest. And I, I found, um, when I, I I'll, I'll actually just reference this project that I, I'm doing because it was the really the first time I haven't publicly announced it yet. So here's the first time we're talking about it. <laughs> but I'm I'm commissioning 40 songs for my 40th birthday next year. And when yes, and both Melissa and Ronaldo are involved. But when I had this idea, I you know last year I was like absolutely convinced that once I started asking composers, a no one would have time. Also, because I have very little money and 40 songs is a lot of songs, I was convinced that they would be absolutely insulted by my budget. I was, you know, I just had all of these roadblocks that I put in front of myself before I even asked anyone if they wanted to do it. And then once I started asking people, I was humbled and like overwhelmed by the positive response I received. And so I've been kind of learning as I go you know, as well. And, and I think it really just takes a little bit of bravery, but also having an idea about what you, what it is you want to do and who you are as an artist so that when you approach a composer, you can say, here's why I want to commission something. You may not have an actual poem in mind, but you might have a genre or you might say like, what projects have you been wanting to bring to life for Soprano? How can I help you do that? You know, kind of ha allowing for a back and forth. So it's not a, you know, not necessarily all performer driven kind of allowing for a dialogue, I think is important or it has been important for me anyway. Yeah. If well, I might, so go ahead. I'll just jump a, a real quick thing. Um, I've I've done it a number of times. I'm sure the of you have done this too. You have a yeah. you meet a performer that really yeah. speaks to you, and you can reach out to them and say, rather than it being a, a performer-led initiative, like I've reached out to singers and and musicians, and I don't. Yeah, I'm, I didn't just make that distinction. Sorry. Like. Um, um, <laughs> instrumentalists and singers and and just be like hey you know like i really like your work um here is my stuff i really love to 
to be able to collaborate. So it's not just the performer reaching out to the composer. I think that it happens both ways as well. Or sometimes you have a kind of um, a matchmaker, like uh, our friend Lisa, who kind of got um, Laura and I working together. Or she, she was kind of the, the pianist in between, who knew my work from going to school together or knew your work from collaborating with you a bunch. And then that's how that match happened. Yeah. And, and yeah. social media helps us all connect, right? So yeah. Mel Melissa and I have never met. I, Ronaldo and I have worked really closely. When Melissa and I have never actually met in person, but we had a matchmaker a few years ago when I was looking for a specific thing. And I said, do you know anybody who might be doing this sort of thing? And he said, talk to this person. Melissa and I friended it on Facebook. And I don't know, I feel like we've gotten to know each other pr in a, you know, social media kind of way pretty well. I mean, social, social media is now also real life. You know, it used to be kind of this, this distinction of this is social media and this is real life. Yeah. And now, well, especially this year when <laughs> social media is all we have mostly, you know, social media is real life and you do get to know people. And in some cases, you know, I've gotten to know people on social media in a way that I never would have in real life. You know, like I, I it's not like I'm flying to St. Thomas to see, <laughs> you know, and and I'm <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> away from St. Thomas people. <laughs> <What is that? laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm seeing people's families, and I'm seeing you know their views, their philosophies, their the way that they work artistically, which to me is like not very different to the way they work personally. Um, and just like I'm such a fan of breaking down those barriers. I want to just like hard agree with what Reynaldo just said. Earlier on in my career, I actually did make the mistake once of um, of assuming that people were too good like you know it's like that imposter syndrome right where you sort of go you know oh they're too good and i'm not on the echelon and so i'll just sit back and i won't contact them and then you know eventually i got so desperate that i was like screw it i'm gonna con i'm gonna start contacting the people who i think are too good for me and the response was amazing mm -hmm. um so it's you know yeah we all have the same problem. Divest yourself of the imposter syndrome that makes that like hampers you from making these connections and just try to make them. Yeah, totally. All right, let's get into some um, some logistics that you that might get uh, discussed at the beginning or during a composite um, uh, a commissioning process. Um, for example, setting a timeline. How does that get sorted out? I presume it can look any, you know, a, a ton of different ways. Can I can I start here since I've got this stupid project, amazing project, maybe amazing, just amazing project that has like so many moving parts with forty composers, forty poets, so many moving parts. And I had the idea in November of last year. I think I, you, Ronaldo's the very first composer I actually spoke to, and you were i think i talked to you in december maybe january because again i had all of this like can i actually do that it feels like it was five years ago <laughs> i know five years ago but it's time before yeah. corona. <laughs> um and in my mind i was like well i turned 40 in 2021 so that's going to be the deadline for the project so and i kind of wish i'd had this idea two years ago because now knowing how many moving pieces there are you know it really takes time and so what i have done is i have said to each composer like if you can have it by February of 2021, that would be great. Let's discuss if that's possible. There is flexibility. I think flexibility is key because because we all work an out, a year, two years, five years out. Mm -hmm. So just opening the dialogue, at least, you know, on, from my end, it was kind of like just being ultimately being completely flexible because we all require that. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I have a dance card. I call it my dance card that I kind of fill out and I have, you know, my my deadlines filled out. And I know from experience that um, there are pro if someone calls me and says, I have a great commission and it's due in six weeks and, uh, and I look at my dance card and I have other deadlines coming up, you know, I have to say no because I know from experience if I say yes, I'm going to pay for it in mental health for the next six months. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so for me, it's like um, the timeline thing is usually people reach out to me to me and they already have a timeline in mind. Like most people who are commissioning things have a premiere date that they're thinking of. Okay. Um, if you don't, great, invent one. Just mm -hmm. think about your 
you know, what, what your plan is going to be like. It's very helpful for a composer to have a, an idea of, you know, what the plan is. Um, and then I will look and sort of say, yes, that is possible for me. I can see the three weeks that I can, don I can uh, dedicate to this project. Or listen, it's not going to work out this time, but keep me in your Rolodex and maybe next time, you'll have a project that's planning that fits into my schedule. I mean, this is the, this is the same issue for all musicians, right? right. It's like, yeah. this is not, this is not some kind of sorcery that's any different from what performers do. Right. right. Lots of, lots of parallels here. Um, the, yeah, uh, just go ahead, Renato. The deadlines that I think deadlines are for me, at least, I don't know how, what it's like for you, Melissa, but I think that, I mean, I kind of heard that in your, what you just said without deadlines, I'd be toast. Like it's just, it, <laughs> I was just like, I don't know. I think I could, I could make that melody a little bit better. <laughs> I'm fundamentally lazy, right? It's like yeah, fundamentally. <laughs> and then, yeah, I basically put it in the calendar, and then I know, like, I have internal deadlines for myself. Like, if the piece is due this date, I try to have something done a few weeks before that, so I could let it sit and kind of make some adjustments. And so all of that is all of that is great. But yeah, I think that deadlines are usually baked into the project yeah with we, reasons and just all kinds of other considerations structure needed but yeah. definitely don't contact a composer ever guys and say could could you write me a song for next week maybe <laughs> like unless they are your best friend as being a singer you would you know just kind of like this it's like basic human consideration right so like <laughs> I understand these things take time. <laughs> I will say that kind of commission very, very, I don't want to encourage it, but very, very occasionally, uh, if someone, for instance, a couple of years ago, a choir reached out to me with a very short commissioning timeline, but the piece they wanted to commission from me was um, uh, the text was taken from Christine Blasey Ford's testimony uh, for the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. And, you know, and Normally, I would have said no because the timeline was so short. But I actually said, "This is so timely that I need to produce it now." And B, yeah. I'm never going to get this commission again. Like, it's not like someone in a year's time or two years' time is going to say, "Hey, remember those hearings? Can we write a piece about that?" <laughs> so I and and I was feeling very raw emotionally, and it was like, "This is the time to write it right now." This yeah. is a very exceptional circumstance, and you have to have the right composer that you know their body of work. You know they're going to be passionate about this project and that they can do it in time. Um, I did pay for it in mental health. <laughs> but for the yeah. timeline and the subject matter you had to yes. live within. Exactly. But it's like, again, even if your timeline seems really short, that you don't have much to lose by reaching out and just being honest. And if the composer says no, then they'll say no. Sometimes as a composer and a composition teacher, I'll say, not me, but I know composers who are looking for work right now who would love this project. And I will bump it you know, to someone, I will give you names and numbers that you can contact for amazing new composers, people of color, women that you haven't heard of who need a start. So reach out. Yeah. Yeah. Very All good right. point. Last little logistic before we start talking about the wonderful artistic side of this. Um, uh, fees and how all that's uh, whether it's negotiated, whether it's fixed. I, I <laughs> presume Ronaldo and Melissa can pretty much only speak to their your own personal um, uh, circumstances. But if you can give any sort of insight into what that part of the commissioning process would look like. I think it depends on a, on a number of reasons, right? I mean, I, my experience with fees is that it, if it's an, a performing organization, if it's a, an established ensemble or an orchestra or um, a chamber ensemble that's exist, that existed or whatever, um, they usually have their budgets set up for these things and then they, they might approach, approach you and they say, okay, so, we want you to do a piece for us, and um, it's usually you. You have a conversation that's an hour long, and you speak about all kinds of other things for fifty-five minutes, and then the last five minutes, like, like rather, you know, if you're having like actual lunch, you know, if you remember that when you like <laughs> got together with people outside of the table with other humans. <laughs> um, did we hug? Did we hug back in those times? Did we do it? 
is when you start talking about money. Like that's been my experience. It's always like the last little thing. Um, but they usually have a, a pretty good sense of where they're at in terms of like the their budget and what they can afford and, and what, what they budgeted for this project. So there's that. Um, I think that art song is a whole other kind of worms because um, it's not like the world of art song is swimming in, in cash, right? So, um, so I think that those considerations are different and I think it's much more, um, I wanna work with such and such artists. I wanna make this collaboration. I've had this idea to do something like this. And I think um, there, in, in those cases, there is much more of a negotiation um, that, that happens in, in those things. My, um, my situation is particular. I have a I have a teaching job, and that gives me a kind of um, support, you know, for lack of a better uh, word. Um, a buffer. Sorry. A buffer. Yeah, a buffer exactly, so that I can I have the luxury sometimes of taking on work that um, that I really believe in, but might not be the the best paid thing in the world. And that's not a judgment on it. It's just you know that. You right. want to make something happen, and sometimes that's that, that's a budget you have. Um, so, why I what I will do sometimes is that I will take a lower commission fee, or I will. My wife doesn't like me to take um, free free work anymore, <laughs> <laughs> but I will sometimes negotiate something like, "Great, I will give you this piece for a lower fee if you perform it a number of times, and if you can, um, and don't be afraid." if you're having those tricky conversations that that's very much an option that should be on the table. If you've got a, a several recitals lined up, I mean, when, again, when you, we used to have those, um, that, that can be a, a really strong incentive for composers to, to kind of work because not only does it get the work out there in the world, but it also, you know, through the um, performing rights organizations, the composers are getting paid for that work as well. So, right. So I so checked to come like a year and a half later. But. The age old joke that artists and musicians um, uh, dig at because we're so sick of it. The, the, uh, the, uh, but it'll give you exposure. Well, okay. <laughs> there's that, there's the negative side of that, but then there are legitimate circumstances where that can, where that sort of concept can play into adding value to you know, I you're you're not being say you're not being asked to write a new cycle for free, and people are just like, well, can you do this for us for free because it'll give you exposure? But like you said, Renato, in a, in in exchange for possibly a lower dollar fee than what you would maybe hope for, if there if there are other ways that you can add value to the project, like multiple performances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or the the free the the rights to to a high quality video, for example, like sure. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that yeah. I can stick on my website and, and I put it on social media. That's not always a given that composers get those rights for from live performances and things, especially if you're working with orchestras that are a union and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in fact in the middle of kind of negotiating a commission with, a, with an orchestra that might have to go video next year because they're not able to present live concerts. And I basically just, the one thing I ask is like, if we're gonna go all video, like I really, really, really cannot emphasize this enough that I want to be able to put it on my website. And, and that's not out of the question. I mean, a, a lot of arts organizations are gonna have to grapple with that and come up with a really fair solution because um, artists are, uh, as far as Cincinnati Song Initiative is, is concerned, artists are the content creators and Cincinnati Song Initiative is the producing platform. And so yes, there is joint creatorship um, in, in making it all happen, but it, it, it's as simple as it wouldn't happen without the artists. So um, to provide things like a copy of the performance for your own use um, is should absolutely be within the question, whereas it hasn't always been in the past. So I, I hope that we start seeing that sliding scale slide a little more these days. 
I mean, I, just, I want to lay cards on the table just for people who are like, but nobody's mentioned dollar amounts yet. Okay, so so uh, I don't know how to drop a link in the chat, but New Music USA has a commissioning fees calculator, which anybody can, you can Google commissioning fees calculator, New Music USA or New Music Box, uh, and it will come up with a thing. And it's great. It's kind of this little, you know, flow chart type thing where you choose what kind of commission you have and uh, what it's what the length of it is, what the instrumentation is, and it will give you a ballpark, which is a big ballpark. Mm -hmm. So if you enter um, piano and voice and under 10 minutes and enter it into that thing, the commissioning ballpark that that website comes up with, which I pretty much agree with, is between $2,500 and $6,500 for an under 10 minute piece. It basically works out to, you know, somewhere between $500 and $1,000 a minute um so you know which is about right to me and that seems like a huge like one is half the fee of the other right <laughs> um but this is kind of like very ballpark if an organization like an art song collective comes to me and they say we are funding a commission what are your fees you know this is the sort of ballpark that i'm gonna talk about with them um just as a straight fee um composers gotta eat we gotta pay rent you know this is labor it takes a long time to compose a piece of music it's not like you know it's some um, weird mozart i mean not for me anyway not like mozartian <laughs> talent where i just sort of sit down and go it was already in my head and now here it is it's just the cost of engraving the scribbling stuff in my head <laughs> it's, it's not that <laughs> I'm, I'm much more in the uh beethoven know, yeah, I guess so, you know. Slaving well, over that melody. Yeah. Long walks, walks in the in the woods, although not so much any long walks up and down my house and my stairwell, hitting myself in the head, <laughs> wrestling with insecurity, you know, writing a, a, a passage of music 18 times because I'm not happy with it, that kind of thing. Um, and it takes time, you know, it's a full-time job. If you did it hour for hour, dollar for dollar, I'm not making that much hourly rate, right. actually, you know. Um, again, performers, you can so relate to this. I know. Well, I'm, really glad you're, I'm really glad you're saying it because I do spend a lot of time with composers and you're not in the minority. That yeah. you know, I spend a lot of time just kind of talk and shop and you're, what you're saying is exactly what a lot, if not all composers I know say. It is work. Yeah. It is, it can be difficult. It can be very like, you know, they're in the same way that when a performer's on stage and we feel like we're burying our soul and if we make a mistake, we uh, will always be defined by that mistake. You know, these composers are putting things on the page that once we perform it many times that, you know, no matter, there's no, there's no editing, like that's right. it forever. Right. And so like right. it, there's pressure in the sense that you don't want to feel like you put something out into the world that isn't what you exactly want out in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. for real, for real. So for me, um, I mean, one of the one of the other factors for me is that sometimes I produce my own stuff. Not all composers do this, but sometimes, you know, I've done it with a piece called the Gonzales Cantata, which was kind of the work that put me on the map as a composer, where I produced a performance of it for the Philadelphia Fringe Festival. Um, and I'm planning on doing it with some of my other larger scale works coming up. So what I've done for some performers who've approached me and said, I have no money, but I really want to commission a new work from you. You know, what are my options? I'll say there are two options here, right? Three, really. One is to do a Kickstarter. Let's make it a, uh, a sort of a crowdsourced thing. We can bring people on board who really want this new work to be created, and we all have a hand in it. The second thing is form a consortium find some other singers who are interested in co-commissioning this work and pull resources together and you all get to premiere it in your respective areas in your respective ways. And the third option, which, you know, is sort of, sort of like what Reynaldo was saying for me anyway, is um, I will write you a piece of music if you pledge to perform in another thing that I'm producing uh, which may be this year, it may be next year, it may be five years down the road. You know, I'm writing an opera and it has 10 roles and I'm freaking out because I want to record this opera myself. I don't have the funds to pay all of my singers market rate, but I have literally written several songs for singers that I'm like, 
when I call this chip in, <laughs> mm -hmm. you will come to Philadelphia, you know, from wherever you are. If you're galvanizing <laughs> around the upper houses of Europe, I don't care. An I'm island in the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't care what it is. You will get your butt to Philadelphia and you will sit in front of a microphone and you will record what I've asked you to record because that's the payment, you know. Um, and uh, so far that's that's worked out pretty well. And, you know, for composers who have that side of their career as well, not everyone does it. Some composers are like, I just write the notes and send them to a publisher and that's it. But for composers who do dabble in that side of things, that can be a bargaining chip. I think most composers these days are having to do their own producing because like, if you want to get your stuff seen, you often end up having to do that kind of work, and it's I, I like it, and it, it's it, it's tricky, and there's a lot that goes into it. But I hadn't even thought of of that option. That's a really good idea of kind of like, um, <laughs> I'll do you a solid now, and then you know in the future, and you know that's a, that's ultimately a win win for everybody because if that yeah. collaboration, yeah. if there is synergy in that collaboration, like, yes, I want to keep working with the performers who who do amazing things with my music and performers, you want to keep working with composers that make you sound amazing. Yep. Right? Yeah. So why not continue that? That's a great idea. That's it's a, a labor idea. swap. It's, it's, it's just, it's a labor swap and you're yeah. also taking money out of the equation, which I'm kind of a fan of as well in some ways, you know, where it's like, you can't tax, a commission, <laughs> you know, and yes, you can't use it to pay rent as well, but I would have that expense anyway of paying a performer to come in and record something of mine anyway. So if you're working with a performer that you know down the road, you're going to ask to pay you to, to come and sing something, it's kind of a no brainer to me. Yeah, it's just and, the, and the other dividends are, are you're collaborating with musicians, you're getting to know each other's styles better, you're getting to know the performer's voices better so that when you compose for them over and over, it gets kind of, everything just fits yeah. more and more and more and more and these are the, this is exactly what we can you know this is the dream for any of us right mm -hmm. yeah totally well thanks for uh broaching the that nitty gritty uh par part of it but uh, you know it's really great to have as part of this uh full-on conversation but um let's let's switch to more more artistic stuff to to speak about so um I'm once again, I'm sure that this is kind of all over the spectrum, but let's talk about a couple of the different scenarios where the composer and the commissioner and any other forces involved, frankly, are collaborating or whether it's one sided on choosing the poet or the text for a commission or directing the aesthetic of the piece, even um, like how they if there's some sort of vision for the kind of piece they want? Like, what is the level of uh, dialogue and interaction between commissioner and composer for that? Do you want to take this one, Melissa? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, it varies, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, like when Laura approached me, she was very much like, do you have a poet that you want to set? Is there something that you've been looking at that, you know, you would want to turn into this? Let's talk. It's very flexible. I've also had people approach me and say, this is what I want. I want a setting of this poem, you know. Right. Uh, normally I'll end up putting my own spin on that anyway because mm -hmm. I like to sort of pull apart my texts and, and interpolate other things into my texts and that sort of thing. Um, so text is kind of an open question. Sometimes, um, actually the most common thing is probably a commissioner who will say, we have a theme for a concert or a season or you know a, um, a dedication, like a, a a donating person has has uh, wanted to to make a piece that's about this particular theme. Um, you find a text that's on this theme and clear it with me, and we'll go from there. Like that's that's super super common. Um, but with regard to musical style, you know, I mean, I think the most important thing that a commissioner can do is know what they're buying. You know, right. <laughs> like do you do your research? You know what composers are capable of and what they've already put out there into the world and i assume you want to compare that composer to keep working in that style you know that you're not sort of <laughs> saying you know 
now, but I want, I want this, but I want it serialist. You know, I know you don't do serialism, but this is what I want. I am assuming you're not doing that. Um, for composers that have, you know, I guess I have, for instance, a lot of different styles of music. You know, I have some music that's very, that's sort of pastiche of Baroque or whatever. I have some music that's more sort of musical theater and I have music that's very concert music, art music, you know, playing with tonality. And it's okay to sort of say, I want you to write something more in the vein of this work that you already do. Um, I think that's that's acceptable, but I would sort of shy away. I mean, it depends, I guess, on the composer and the commissioner. Um, I would shy away from you sort of dictating the musical style of the piece. I'm assuming you're approaching the composer um, because you appreciate their voice. Yeah. Um, show up at mcdonald's and said like i want a filet mignon you know with with a <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yep. that's that, right. yes that's 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 a that's an extra layer of involvement and uh fellow composer juliana hall completely agrees with you that we yeah. should probably just leave it up to your devices and i mean you bring a, gr a, a good point to put a nuanced point onto that is you know if you if you want a certain aesthetic to the piece and you have this kind of Rolodex of composers you're choosing from, pick the composer who you know will like you'll jam with best for the thing you're envisioning. But like, don't lean over their shoulder and be like, eh, do this. Do this. You know. Yeah, right. so. I do. I do think um, a certain amount of leaning over the shoulder, I think, is a part of the creative process and a, and a part of the collaborative process. Um, and I don't know how much we want to get into compulsive writing for the voice, Laura. You you probably can speak more about this. Um, at least in my own training, writing for the voice was not something that I was taught directly, hmm. like an orchestration. Like we all took orchestration class, and so I know what kinds of things work in a flute or a piccolo or, or a tuba but nobody really talks about the human voice in that way. I'm sure, I know that that's changing and I know that that's not a universal experience for composers, but I think that um, it's not unusual for composers to not have had that kind of, of, of training. And so, I, I, but I think that that's a fundamentally different thing from what you were talking about of like, you know, you somebody reaches out to me and says, oh, you're from Venezuela, I write to me this like, Latin fiesta type thing, you know? Right, right. Uh, right, that, <laughs> yeah. that, put a pin on that and we can come back to that in a second. But I do think in terms of um, what actually works in the voice and how it works in, in the particular singer's voice, I know, Laura, I remember that when I sent the score that for one of the songs that we that I worked on for you and Lisa, that, that I don't know if it was you or Lisa, but she's like, "Yeah, I think that this is this song is not going to work at this pitch level. Can we can we put it higher or something like that?" And um, and that's a that's a very simple like an easy fix. But then there are other that there are other considerations of things like you know, um, how a particular singer's voice works and things like that. And I think that composers we we need to be humble about. Um, that collaboration process and being able to take that that feedback from the, from the singers, understanding that um, what they're doing is an incredibly vulnerable and precious thing that they're putting out into the world. You want them to feel comfortable and want them to feel their best, and that you can help them do that. And it's okay to have a version of your song that works for Laura, and then a different version of that song that works for a different singer or a different pianist. And I think that that's fine, but we have to be flexible. And I think that the, the beauty and the collaboration is kind of it, being able to put the two brains together and the two souls together to, or however many souls are a part of that to, um, to kind of make sure that everybody feels thriving and a part of that process. Yeah. To have a soul baby. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. In the words of, of Kathy Kelly in our 
in our Cincinnati Song Slam from back in January when we were still meeting in person, um, a bunch of new song babies were born and it was just this creative process. So yeah, uh, fellow composer Kurt Erickson is chiming in. Maybe instead of leaning over the shoulder, we should think of it as an invitation to join the creative conversation. Of course, this yeah. the, uh, just a collaborative spirit uh, amongst all, all parties involved, um, you know, just staying in the lanes of respecting the specialty of the performer versus the composer. But of course there should be dialogue and talking um, just so that you come up with the best end result for everybody involved, right? And I know composers, you know, com we don't all have the same process and some composers are more open to that kind of collaboration than others, you know. Um, for myself, I actually, I came to composing originally through theater which is, of course, is an extremely collaborative art form where, you know, you can't do anything in theatre without collaborating with all of the people around you. Uh, so I'm very open to feedback from performers and commissioners, um, you know, to a certain extent. I mean, if they're sort of like, you know, Mickey Mouse dictating what all the notes are supposed to be, I'm like, yeah, no, that's not going to work for me. But if you, if you come back and say, you know, this sounds awkward, or do you mind if I transpose this up a half step, which, you know, recently happened to me actually with the choral piece, I'm super open to that. Um, not every composer is right. actually, you know, and that's something to note. I would actually recommend that if you have a, a large enough commission that you are worried about the collaborative process with that composer, find out who else has commissioned that composer and reach out to them huh. and ask, how did this composer, you know, how did that work for you? You will, you know, most people I think, you know, are willing to sort of say, hey, they were really, really uh, collaborative or, you know, this was kind of a case of we knew what they were going to produce, we let them do it and they gave it to us and it was exactly what we ordered or hopefully not, but you never know. This was a really difficult process and I had a tough time, <laughs> in which case you may want to back off or think about whether that's the kind of process that you want. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of... It, I mean, it, it's like with anything, with any kind of job, with any kind of career, right? Like if you're if you're if you're applying to a college, a, un, a new university, your due diligence includes finding students who are already there, reaching out to them, and saying, "What's it like? What's the culture like? What are the teachers like? What is you know?" And if you're going to drop a bunch of money on a commission, um, you maybe want to know what that composer is like to work with if you want a truly collaborative process, right? So, you know, reach out, get references. Right. It'll be on the website. It'll be in their scores who worked with them. Yeah. <laughs> and again, social media, super easy to just drop an email to someone and say, I noticed you commissioned this person. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Can you, would you recommend that I do the same? Yeah. That is fantastic advice and I have never heard it before. So I'm like learning stuff here too today. <laughs> um, so I went to um, kind of a new music Thing a few years ago and I met all of these composers and I was kind of like looking for team art song right like who are my people where are my people at and I got a lot of like oh no I don't do songs and I got a lot of kind of like oh songs and I kind of I wanted to ask I wanted to ask it, it, the two of you like why you love to compose songs and why you do why you choose to and and because I, I just I'm really I'm always this, I love to talk to composers about this kind of thing because I've realized the further I get into this that it is a choice and I didn't realize <laughs> years ago that it was. So if, I was just hoping maybe you guys would, would tell us why you like composing songs. Well, for me, if I may jump in first, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, for me, I realized that for better or for worse, I've always been telling stories in my music. So. I just finished an orchestra piece and and if I were to sort of go through the story of that in program note form, it would take like two pages to kind of tell you everything that I'm doing. And this is just for my own brain. It's not necessarily that the, the public needs to know all about that or, or in order for that to come through. I just, I, I've always loved narrative arcs and, and telling stories and sharing um, words. And and so in the songs, you you have that you have that tool that that extra thing that uh that creates a, a different kind of meaning making right that you can get from from that um another aspect of it for me is you know i'm bilingual i, I 
and and kind of exploring the two different parts of my personality. My English song sounds different than my Spanish song. Um, and that to me is a, is a fun thing to do. And also there's just the best singers are the art song singers. So, <laughs> he said it here, folks. He said it here. Um, I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> I mean, what what I mean by that is that that devotion that they have to their craft and and to not just being able to sing the notes, but also kind of bring those stories to life in in that setting. To devote your life to that, I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful thing, and then you're you're trying to. Join that 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 beautiful space, and why wouldn't you want to be a part of that? I do think. I mean, I go back to the the training thing. Like, right, like in in terms of the training, like if you went to conservatory, like I did, like so much of the emphasis in that training is like you got to write for orchestra and string quartets, and if you're writing for anything other than that, like you've sold out, and like you know, you might as well just move to the Midwest and like buy a house and have a bunch of kids. Oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I co-sign everything there. Uh, the storytelling aspect, the working with language. I'm not bilingual, but uh, I love language. As I mentioned, I came to this um, through theater originally. You know, my first ever com composing that set me on this path was because I was doing Shakespeare and I uh, got tapped at the last moment to write songs for A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, but even before that, you know, I was... Uh, I grew up singing and uh, and acting and performing. And, um, and there's something very special about the human voice as a timbre. I mean, I could go on about this all day, how it's like, it's the first music you hear is like your mom singing when you're in the womb. And, and, you know, the human ear is so tuned to the human voice that you can hear it over an orchestra. Your ear will pick out that timbre and, and latch onto it. And it's so powerful, you know, um, so I grew up singing in choirs and, uh, you know, I, um, I loved opera from a young age. I was a really weird kid, uh, <laughs> taking myself to the opera when I was like 15, 16 by myself because none of my friends nor my family had any interest in it whatsoever. But I was like, I love it. Um, and, you know, and then as a, in my late teens, I got a few years of, you know, opera training lessons, singing lessons uh, in Sydney. Um, and it's not the path I took, but I still feel very connected to it. And I feel music in my body. And uh, and I, you know, not all composers do that. <laughs> you know, sometimes it, it composers think are very sort of heady as opposed to like feeling it in their body and in their throat and everywhere. Um, so for me, um, just vocal music was just the thing that came most easily to me, I think because of all of those experiences. And I got very lucky in that the teachers that I had when I was doing my music degrees were very open to that and very encouraging of my interests. And then it kind of took off. So I will say like singers more than any other people and not just art song singers, but like choral singers and, you know, opera singers are, the gamest musicians that I've worked with, you know, they are, they actually, they get really excited about the stuff that you create for them. If they love a piece, they will champion it in a way that apologies to string players. I'm also <laughs> there by training, but like, like I tell people this all the time. It's like my music gets spread because a singer sings a choir piece and they sing with another choir and they will take my music and give it to the, the artistic director and say, you should look at this piece. Like, can you imagine a second violinist in an orchestra who also plays with another orchestra being like, excuse me, maestro. Is, is, this, is, this, uh, is this the best instance of singers being super spreaders? Is this the kind of, this is the kind of super spreading we want? Okay. Really want, you know, and it's like I it's amazing. Like the sing singers become my friends, and it's they make your music self-propagating and they champion it. And part of it to me is because it becomes part of them too when they're singing it in a much sort of easier and more organic way than I think a lot of instrumentalists 
connect with music. Um, so yeah, I love writing for voice. Almost all of my music now has a vocal element to it. Um, and I love working with text. I love the possibilities that, I love how text will, um, will give me like more, musical ideas that I may not have had if I didn't have a text to guide me. You know, the flaws in the text will actually create the most interesting musical ideas of all. I love working with flawed texts because a perfect text, you know, it just kind of suggests itself. But if you have to work around a flaw in a text, I mean, it's, this is like very sort of metaphysical, but it's like a pearl and Barocco, right? And Go like, there. Yeah, working your way around um, something that doesn't quite scan can actually create the most amazing, interesting music. So that's why so many of my texts are things like speeches and prose and essays and things that normally wouldn't get thought of as a song, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I could wax lyrical about this. It's, it's what I do, it's what I love doing, but um, it's because of you, it's because of the singers that, that I, most love working in this medium. And any other singers listening, you know, we were talking about researching your composers. If you ask them that question and you get an answer like Reynaldo or Melissa gave you, like commission that person. Jump <laughs> <laughs> and, and kind of think back on what Melissa just said. I mean, about your the the singers being super spreaders and things like that. I think, and I go back to what I said a little bit ago, like if you enter that collaboration in that spirit of like, you want your singers to feel like they're in cloud nine singing your music and you're able to be flexible and make adjustments so that they can feel comfortable, not just comfortable, but thriving. Like I'm going to own this room. You're going to listen. And, and, and that could be a high loud note or it could be this, the, I remember still Laura that, that you made that decision to like basically just almost like whisper this section in, in, in the piece. And that was just as breathtaking as a big high dramatic moment, right? Um, but if you have that flexibility to kind of let them do that and, and make it feel that they have ownership on that and that it's in their voice and they're gonna take it a lot further than if they have to twist themselves into pretzels to, to sing every single note and they don't, there's no room in that collaboration for the singers to really feel like they're expressing themselves to that they're a part of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's so true. And that doesn't actually mean that the music can't, can't be hard. I have s expressed myself very efficiently in hard music. I have done, I have, it, it, just, it doesn't mean it doesn't, is what I'm trying to say like hard music can still, be a wonderful avenue towards singer self-expression that I don't know how, I'm not expressing myself well but <laughs> um, no, I guess, yeah, yeah it has more to do with um like how you approach it how you um how you set it up how you take away from it how you the context of whatever it is you've written um than what you know the actual figure is I mean I I I'm just, I'm not speaking. No, even something as simple as like <laughs> to have the conversation with the singer about what this passage means. And sometimes composers, we get defensive about when the singer is like, what, what are you trying to do here? It always, it, that, that question can come across as like the performers have doubts and no, they're just trying to like understand what you're trying to do so that they can sell, it, right? Like even just being open to have that conversation about like, what's your intention here? I, I've never had a, a, a performer, especially a singer, be like, oh, that's too hard, or like, I can't do that, or please, like, change. It's it's not, it's never like, I physically can't do this. It's more like, if you want all of these things to line up, one of these things have to has to kind of give a little bit. Well, and that goes back to the, the everybody's in on the creative process sort of thing. Yeah. And a, a performer can give you that sort of feedback. And that might be their area of expertise um, that they can offer to help make the final product better. Especially if you want to, especially if there's a goal that the commission becomes accessible to theoretically any singer to sing. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to the very specific commissions written for one singer and they may have all these things worked into them that are very special techniques or effects for the premiering singer. 
you know, there's well, and that's kind of, you know, I've got this pro commissioning project, 40 songs from 40 composers. I ha some of these composers I've worked with before, some I haven't. Ultimately, they're all doing it with my voice in mind. I really hope this the, the whole point of this project is that it have a life outside of me, that other singers sing out these songs, other singers learn about these composers, learn their other music, love them as much as I love them in their totality, not just for this one song they've written. So it would be like, I'm hoping that everyone who is approaching it as like, okay, well, Laura can do this. And like, but I also, you know, will other people sing it? if I write it this way, you know, like, or, you know, whatever, like I want, I, I want it to have a bigger life than me. And I, and I think with any song commission and not just for my, my project, like we, if you write it for one person and only, and that's the only singer on the planet who can sing a, 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 a high above, above high C, like that song will have a small, a, a short life. And maybe that's exactly what you want because you are the only soprano in the United States who can sing a high A above high C and you want, everyone to know you can do it and that you know this is your song cycle and everyone else better stay away like if that's your goal then that's what you need <laughs> yeah. i guess know what you want what you want the life of that song cycle to be and you can talk to the composer about that as well yeah i find some some com commissioners um will approach things like i want you to write something for your for, for this performer you know this voice um and i love doing that too like sometimes you click on a we composers do our research as well. When we get a, a commission for a particular performer, you know, I will hunt down every last recording I can find for that performer and listen to them all to see what that performer can do, to see what sounds good in their voice, to see what, you know, what they seem to like to sing, what rings out, what leaps they can make, what colors their voice can make. Um, these are really, you know, it's like researching any instrument, like it's researching an instrument, right? Um, but some commissioners, and I love when this happens, are thinking more broadly about expanding the literature for everybody. Um, and I think that's really important right now because it's it's a trap of modern contemporary music to write stuff that is a showpiece for performers. And what this means is that student singers, student performers, uh, musicians um, coming up through the ranks don't have access to this new music because it's too difficult and it's not right for developing voices and developing talents. Um, so that is something that I would encourage commissioners or people who are thinking of, of um, being a co-creator of some new music out there. If you, if this is a concern for you, if you're like, you know what, why are we singing the same 24 Italian songs and arias, you know, for hundreds of years and none of, my students under the age of 20 have touched a contemporary piece of music, then reach out and tell the composer that specifically. Tell them the kind of piece that you want to put out into the world. And when that piece is created, it will probably get more performances than anything else that that composer has put together. You know, it's like my stuff that I've created that's more accessible gets sung by so many people. And I love that. That's like the goal, yeah. right? Wonderful. Any parting thoughts? I think we've really covered a lot of ground here, but and any last things that we didn't cover that anybody wants to discuss? No? <laughs> well, th thank you all three of you. We had a great um, audience as well with, with plenty of uh, interaction and it, it looks like we reached as far as Peru uh, with this live stream. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Hello. Thank you, Melissa and Ronaldo and Laura for joining us. And um, folks, if you don't have your CSI mug yet, you must go check out our merch store and get yourself one so that you can join us uh, for our next coffee combo session with your very own CSI mug. And um, we look forward to the next session. But until then, thank you all three of you. Uh, hope you stay well and safe. And thank you so much for being with us here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having us. See ya. <laughs> Bye.